Hi everyone, we're now going to introduce Alpha, this fish looking guy, <laughs> the significance level of a hypothesis test, our third ingredient. Remember, the other two ingredients were the actual null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis, H sub A or H sub one. Here's the third ingredient, alpha, the significance level. And basically, it is the probability threshold for what it means to be unusual, for a p-value to be too low. Remember what we said earlier. If the p-value is low, the null must go, as in go away. If the p-value is too low, the null must go away. We reject the null. So we reject the idea the coin is fair or the deck of cards is random. What's too low? If the p-value is lower than alpha. If the p-value is lower than alpha, then the p-value is too low, the null must go away, we reject the null. Again, how low must the p-value be for us to reject the null, whether it's in the context of a one-tailed test or a two-tailed test? Lower than alpha. So, before, in lesson 25, we talked about the confidence level of a confidence interval, and we denoted that by one minus alpha. So for example, uh, if we had a 95% confidence interval, the confidence level was 0.95 or 95%, which meant that alpha itself, alpha itself, the complement, was one minus that, or 0.05. This was like the failure probability for the confidence interval. Remember, uh, if we have, like on this Rossman chance applet, if we construct a bunch of 95% confidence interval, in this case for P, where P turns out to be 0.5, so the coin was in fact fair, then about 95% of these confidence intervals, these 95% confidence intervals for P, will contain the true value of P, 0.5, which we know in this case, and about 5% will not contain the true value of P. Here, it looks like 4% of the confidence intervals failed, did not contain the 0.5, but 4% is pretty close to 5%. Uh, we expect that about 5% of the 95% confidence intervals will fail. And again, you can play with this Rossman chance applet. You know, in different situations, you could get different percents. 5%, 6% failing, and so forth, 5% failing, and so forth. All right, alpha is a failure probability that tells how likely it is that a population parameter, such as a population mean mu, or in this case, in the applet, uh, a population probability or proportion, P, uh, is not contained within a CI for that parameter. So like over here, there's a 5% chance that the confidence interval did not contain the true value of P, the 0.5 for the fair coin. Now that was the last, uh, that was in lesson 25. Uh, now here, alpha is the significance level of a hypothesis test. And we'll see how this connects together with the last idea in just a moment. Alpha represents the threshold for what it means for sample results to be too unusual under the null for the null to survive. So for example, uh, maybe you get something like 99 heads in 100 flips of a coin. Well, if you're assuming the coin is fair, it looks like your sample data is presenting pretty strong evidence that that coin is not fair. Uh, the p-value you're gonna get is probably gonna be too unusual for the null, for the null to survive, the idea that the coin is fair. Now, it's typically assumed that alpha is 0.05 or 5%. That is the standard. Uh, just like 95% confidence levels were pretty standard for confidence intervals. And certainly, <laughs> under that kind of a standard, then sure, if you get 99 heads in 100 flips, we would certainly reject the null hypothesis that says that the coin is fair, certainly under that standard. But under these standards as well, uh, 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 other popular values for alpha are 1% or 0 0.01, and alpha equals 10% or 0 0.10. It turns out that alpha would have to be ridiculously close to zero 
for this to be uh, liberal towards the null, for the idea of a fair coin to hold up under these conditions with that sample data. Now, the higher alpha is, the more likely we will not, uh, sorry, <laughs> the higher alpha is, the more likely it is that we will reject the null. Because the, if alpha is high, right, if alpha is high, if alpha is way up here, okay, then it's very likely that the p-value could be any number beneath it, right? So the higher alpha is, the more likely it is that the p-value will be below it, and the more likely it is that we will reject the null. Uh, now, we could say something like, if alpha is high, the null tends to die, because <laughs> it's very easy for the p-value to be below alpha. But I don't want to give you too many rhymes. That could be too confusing. So let's remember this. If the p-value is low, the null must go, as in go away. If alpha is high, it's more likely that the, the p-value is too low. So in a way, a 10% value for alpha would be like a, a really tough judge. It's like, it's going to be very easy for me to call the null guilty. Whereas a 1% judge is far more lenient. Uh, a 1% judge would require a higher burden of proof, a stronger burden of proof to convict a null. So maybe you have your own personal significance level your own personal idea as to what alpha should be. It's, like, it's almost like one of those games at the carnival, right? A test how much you love somebody. <laughs> test your value of alpha. Test your value of alpha. All right. A magician gives you a coin and tells you that the magician's favorite side is heads. You flip the coin and you keep getting heads on this thing. So depending on your personal value for alpha, when do you start saying that the results are too unusual for the coin to be truly fair? And we're going to do a one-tailed analysis here. We're only going to consider heads. So let P of X be the probability of getting X heads in X flips of a fair coin. Again, under the assumption that the null is true. We're performing these calculations. We're calculating these probabilities under the assumption that the null is true. For example, what's P of one? Assuming that this coin is fair, what's the probability that if you flip the coin once, you get a head on that one flip of a fair coin? Well, by definition of a fair coin, one half or 0.5. Now, you have this coin in your hand and you're wondering, is it fair or not? You flip the coin and it comes up heads. Are you ready at this point to call David a liar if David claims that the coin is fair? No, no one would. You flipped the coin, it came up heads. No one would call David a liar if David claimed that his coin was fair, right? If you got a head once on one flip. But what if you flip the coin again? Uh, bear in mind, you should decide on the sample size early on, right? But we're playing this game. You flip the coin again and you get a second head. You get two heads and two flips. What's the probability of getting two heads in two flips of a fair coin by chance? It's one half times one half. We're assuming what I word. We're assuming independence. The result on one flip has nothing to do with the result on the second flip. The probability of getting two heads in two flips of a fair coin, one half times one half, or one half squared, we can use exponents, or about, or exactly 0.25 or 25%. Now at this point, uh, if, if uh, you flip the coin twice and you get a pair of heads, David claims his coin is fair. Although you know that if anything, he may have a bias towards heads. See, here's the thing. I want this to be a one-tailed analysis. This is why I'm doing this. Okay. Now, there's a one in four chance that a fair coin comes up heads twice in two flips. Would you, would anyone be prepared to call David a liar if David claims his coin is fair? Not too many people, almost no one, right? Uh, certainly, these three people wouldn't. Imagine three people, it's almost like the judging panel on America's Got Talent. 
imagine three people as judges here, and they're judging whether or not David really has a fair coin. The alpha value for one judge is 10% or 0 0.10. The alpha value for another judge is 5% or 0 0.05, which is standard. That is what most judges would use. Well, I don't know about jury trials, but <laughs> okay, uh, I'm talking about statistics. Most statistics judges would use 5% as a standard value for alpha. Maybe alpha is 1% for this judge. Alpha is 0 0.01. But for this probability of 0.25, you can think of this as a p-value, like a one-tailed p-value where we're focusing on heads. All right, None of these three judges would be prepared to call David a liar if David claims that his coin was fair. Ah. Now the coin is flipped a third time. What's the probability of getting three heads in three flips of a fair coin? That's one half to the third. It's one half times one half times one half. That's one eighth or 0.125 or 12.5%. David claims his coin is fair. Would anyone call David a liar? Well, maybe some people on earth might call David a liar, but these judges won't. Even this judge here, this judge maybe doesn't like David. <laughs> okay, uh, this judge is already suspicious of David. So maybe this judge beforehand picked an alpha value of 0 0.10 or 10%. But even for this judge, that's toughest on David, three heads and three flips, that's not quite intense enough. That's not quite unusual enough, even for this judge. And it's certainly not unusual enough for these judges. These judges are going to require stronger evidence in order to call David a liar. Ah, now, what's the probability of getting four, flip, four heads in four flips of a fair coin? I mean, presumably fair coin. It's one half to the fourth, which is about 6%. And at this point, ladies and gentlemen, this judge on America's Got Talent, this judge in our statistics class, this judge turns their back on David. This judge says, I'm sorry, David, I now call you a liar. David claimed, his null hypothesis claim, was that my coin is fair. The coin is fair. The probability of getting four heads and four flips in a one-tailed analysis is about 6%. So if this judge's alpha threshold is 10%, this p-value of 6% is too low. The 12.5% was not low enough, but this is too much for the judge to bear. 6.25%, that's lower than 10%. The p-value is too low for this judge. If the p-value is low, the null must go, as in go away. The judge now calls this too unusual for the null to hold up. And at this point, the judge would reject the null hypothesis, the assumption that the coin was fair. So this judge turns their back. But what about the 5% judge and the 1% judge? They're not ready to turn their backs on David yet. They're willing to give David still the benefit of the doubt. The probability of getting four heads and four flips is about 6%. Well, hey, this judge is at 5%. This judge is at 1%. You're going to need stronger evidence to turn these judges. Let's say the coin is flipped again. We now have five heads and five flips. The probability of that happening by chance for a fair coin is about 3%. And at this point, this judge has already turned their back. This judge now turns their back. By the way, it takes some time to get, to get used to this. Uh, I use the term there now in a singular context. I used to not do that. But uh, nowadays, there is now uh, preferred in some sense, even in the singular case. Anyway, <laughs> uh, this 5% judge, they turn their back. This judge says, hey, five heads and five flips. I'm now ready to call David a liar. So Mr. or Mrs. 10% judge, I'm ready to join you. I'm ready to call David a liar. But we still have this holdout. This judge at 1%, 0 0.01. This judge is not ready to call David a liar. 3% is not low enough for this judge. In fact, even if the coin comes up heads in a six flip, that's about 1.6%. That's still not lower than 1%. So this judge is still giving David a chance. 
But then at the seventh flip, all right, the coin has come up heads seven times in seven flips. That is going to be too much even for this 1% judge who might have liked David. So at this point, all three judges say, no, this p-value is way too low for all three of us. We're all going to call David a liar. And you are now off our show. <laughs> this is too unusual, even for the 1% judge. But still, hey, if you have a judge in principle who's at uh, 1 100th of 1%, this isn't unusual enough. <laughs> so you can keep going, going, going. Alpha has to be some positive value. In principle, if alpha is low enough, well, you'll still have some judges hanging in there. So it depends. It depends what the p-value is. It depends what alpha is. If the p-value is low, the null must go, as in go away. It's rejected. What's low? Lower than alpha. All right, the decision rule. Let's formalize that idea. Decision rules for hypothesis tests. And this is a literal term that is used in an advanced statistics class, a decision rule. The decision rule for a hypothesis test using the p-value method. If the p-value is low, as in too low, as in less than alpha, then we reject the null. If the p-value is less than alpha, if it's too low, we reject the null. On the other hand, if the p-value is greater than alpha, then we do not reject the null. The evidence is not strong enough for us to reject the null and call David a liar. We're going to ignore the case where the p-value equals alpha because the probability of that happening is zero anyway. And on homework or exams, I'm not going to pull that stunt on you anyway. The p-value that you end up with will either be less than alpha, in which case you reject the null. The p-value is low, as in lower than alpha, so you reject the null. The null must go away. Or the p-value is greater than alpha, in which case the null does not have to go away. We do not reject the null. Now, we can also talk about a decision rule using the confidence interval method. We've been talking about alpha. How does this relate to a one minus alpha confidence interval for the parameter of interest? In this case, the parameter is P, the probability that David's coin comes up heads. What's the decision rule using the confidence interval method? Let's say that the null hypothesis states that the value of a population parameter is some value C. So in this case here, okay, uh, the null hypothesis would say that the coin is fair, p equals 0.5. All right, develop a one minus alpha confidence interval for the parameter. It could be p, for example, the probability of heads. If this confidence interval does not contain the 0.5 from the null hypothesis, then we reject the null. For example, here, if our confidence interval uh, went from, well, let's blow this up. If our confidence interval goes from, goes from 0.525 to 0.715. If the null hypothesis said that P was exactly 0.5, then if this 95%, let's say there's a 95% confidence interval. If this 95% confidence interval does not contain 0.5, the hypothesized value under the null, then we reject the null hypothesis under the standard that alpha is 5%. Okay, so again, if uh, a 95% confidence interval for the parameter Remember, if we're saying beforehand that alpha is 0.05, which is the standard, right? If we're saying beforehand that alpha is 0.05, then one minus alpha will be 95%. So we're, we're looking for a 95% confidence interval. If and when you construct a 95% confidence interval for P, your population parameter, the probability of heads, if that confidence interval does not contain the hypothesized value for P under the null, 0.5 in this case, since this confidence interval here did not contain the value for p under the null, 0.5, then we reject the null. We reject the idea that the coin was fair. Remember, the null is saying that the coin was fair. The null is saying that the coin was fair. Now, at the 1 minus alpha, or 95% in this case, confidence interval, uh, contains C, contains 0.5 in this case, then we do not reject the null. So basically, you know, there's a 95% chance that your confidence interval uh, will contain the true value for P if you do things appropriately, right? So there's a 95% chance that your confidence interval will contain the 0.5, like this one here. 
this confidence interval for P between 0.323 and 0.517. This does contain the 0.5, which is what the null said. The null said that P was 0.5, okay. which means that we do not reject the null. It means that, it, that uh, it's still feasible that David's coin was fair. We do not reject the idea that David's coin was fair. The null said P was 0.5. We got this confidence interval, which contained 0.5, as a possible value for P, realistically. So we do not reject the null. We don't dump the idea that the coin was fair. But again, do we accept the idea that the coin was fair? Do we accept the null hypothesis? And the answer there is no. I'll cross this out. We never accept the null hypothesis. We might not reject the null, like here. We might not reject the null. Maybe we got like 51 heads in 100 flips. Okay, maybe we got 51 heads in 100 flips, in which, in which case we wouldn't reject the null. Still, we wouldn't accept the null because, well, actually here, uh, uh, the most likely value for P is 0.51, not 0.5. And even if this were 50 heads, we could still say, well, it could have been something else, but we're looking at sampling error. So basically, we get flaky. If we don't reject the null, we get flaky, and we say, you know what? Uh, P could have been 0.5, but we could chalk it up to sampling error. All right. So if uh, we had gotten, say, 99 heads in 100 flips, if we had gotten 99 heads in 100 flips, then it's likely that we would have rejected the null the confidence interval would not have contained P. It would have been too high. The confidence interval would have been way out here somewhere. <laughs> All right. Uh, whereas here, the confidence interval would safely contain the 0.5 if we do not, and that's when we do not reject the null. Okay, next up is 59 heads unusual. Four approaches, next time. 59 heads and 100 flips, next time.